Okay, our first, first presenter is going to be Navander Singh, and I'll allow him to introduce himself. Thank you, Dave. Um, it's really nice to be here and being given a chance to present as the first one on the first day. So I, <laughs> I guess I have to set some standards in terms of time and, and op uh, using it optimally and, and keeping you entertained as well, because I suppose I don't want to put you off with the first talk and then the day goes really bad. So my name is Navinder. I work at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences in northern Sweden. Um, and a little bit, uh, so today I'm going to talk about a little bit about combining internal as well as external environment in the animal and looking at how that affects movement. Uh, some of these things that we've been building up on great work done by Ran and others during this DNAs issue in 2008. A little bit about myself, about my lab. Um, we're working on a lot of different kinds of questions related to movement and spatial ecology, um, so, uh, which include looking at drivers of movements, both internal and external, um, migration of um, large raptors and uh, relating them to land use, such as wind farm development and collisions with trains and power lines and things like that. Uh, looking at further longer distance migrations of uh, things like swifts, which from uh, across seven different countries, tracking them uh, throughout the year and looking at what drives and how population level differences emerge. Um, how does movement and its consequences affect us? Looking at seals and how it, their interactions with fishermen and how the conflicts arise and how fishermen do re retaliation and how these movements have these consequences. Uh, expanding from seals to other species as well, of course. And then, um, a new interesting project is on pool frogs, tracking frogs with these little tiny devices and translocating them to new locations and looking at how they find their homes back. This is more of a conservation project because, um, because pools, uh, pool frogs are an endangered species in Sweden and uh, they need protection and we've been assigned this task to look at some of these issues. So we thought it would be nice to test some of these experimental things and track us with these species. And um, one of the most exciting works uh, right now is on the bears. We're looking at hibernation ecology of bears and combining it with movement, what drives bear in, bears into the den and what drives them out. So while tracking movements, we're also tracking their heartbeat, temperature, and accelerometry and all these things that what happens to the bears when they are inside the den as opposed to what is outside. And if, if it, what happens outside drives them in or what happens inside drives them into the den and then out. So this is the, all these work is, you will see start coming out very soon. It's all in preparation. And what I'm going to present today is also something not published yet. So please feel free to tear it apart and let me know where we can do better and what we can do more about it. Um, so to start off with, uh, we all know the changes in climate and how uh, northern systems are vulnerable and northern animals are so much more vulnerable to uh, rising temperatures. Um, and which leads us to these sort of patterns that we observe that temperature and body size is usually known to influence an ability, an individual's ability to store and use energy. And then um, these, these changes then in turn elevate their metabolic rates and then uh, drives behavioral adjustments and, and movement patterns further in response to the climatic conditions. Um, so little is known about these animals, especially how external uh, environment influences their physiology inside because it has not been possible to track these things in free-ranging animals till now. Um, so this is, you know, this is very crucial in order to understand how these animals will adapt in future changes and how they will respond. Uh, and as I said, most studies till date have been on captive animals. So this is one of the earlier studies that we're doing that sort of is on free-ranging animals that will um, uh, improve our understanding on these sort of questions. Um, moose is a heat-sensitive ungulate. That means it is very sensitive to rising temperatures, both in winters and summers. And so we go down to test if these changes, uh, if these heat-sensitive ungulates will show thermoregulatory behavior to changes in the environment. And can we see anything that changes inside them using new technology? So um, coming back to uh, Rand's framework that they put together in 2008, that how internal state and external environment can combine to, to influence the movement paths of the animals. 
So this is sort of filling up on this framework and adding more new data to using new technologies to, to answer these sort of questions. So uh, in specifically, um, we got down to testing uh, what sort of spatiotemporal patterns we see uh, when we monitor internal um, physiology of animals. And are these patterns consistent across individuals and sites? Uh, do these changes affect movements of individuals, such as the tendency to migrate? And are these, are these movement tendencies also consistent? And do these actually affect movement? So these are the, on these lines today, I will try to uh, address uh, all the analyses. Uh, so the study design is we tracked around 20 moose individuals now for two years. Uh, these individuals have been uh, equipped with GPS collars, activity sensors, heartbeat sensors, and body temperature loggers as well. And you can see how the body temperature logger is fed to the moose. It's just directly fed into the stomach, and it tends to sit in the stomach and records all the data and then transport. Sometimes they tend to burp it out as well, but it usually tends to stay. So as you will see, we've managed to get the data uh, very well. And um, I must acknowledge my colleague, uh, Holger, who's been um, working with managing the database. Uh, we have a RAM system of uh, database, which you will hear more about in the, in the couple of days. Um, so uh, using this sort of data, we've been able to get some very new sort of insights into uh, physiology of moose in the north. Um, so these are the two study areas in Sweden. Uh, I hope uh, I should have put a <laughs> map of the globe where Sweden is. But um, so this is really, really north. <laughs> and then the two areas where we are working in is also northern Sweden. So it's very, very north. And one area you can see is uh, very close to the mountains. And one area is close to the coast. So we get a, a gradient of two different climates. And we have 10 individuals each marked in both the areas. Uh, the elevation in the first area ranges from around um, 1,400 to 2,500 meters. And the other one is from the coast to around 500 meters. Um, so getting down to the first question, what are the spatial temporal changes? So this is one of the first data that you see. So this, is, this data starts in April and then runs till October. So, uh, a good peak uh, um, mean goes from 38 degrees, and then there is a variation between 36 <laughs> and 39 degrees. 39 is more in summer, and, and uh, 36 is more towards the winter. Um, so, um, and further, uh, when we split it into areas, you can clearly see since one of the areas we have started later, so the red area is area one, and the blue one is area two. So we try to com combine some summaries of how temperatures, body temperatures of the animals differ in the two areas remarkably. Um, so also at the seasonal scale, there is a, a, there's a large difference. But on an average, uh, area two, which is closer to the coast, the animals show much lower temperature than the areas uh, one which are more in the mountainous uh, areas. Um, please let me know if you have any questions. Stop me somewhere. And I can do, or we can keep it for later as well. So these are the uh, differences in mean hourly temperatures um, during, during the year. Area two, again, is much, the area close to the coast is much lower temperature um, on an average. So apparently something's going on that um, animals in the colder areas tend to maintain a higher temperature on an average. Similarly, looking at um, the coldest month, which is February, this is really interesting. Um, so uh, this is in area one, which is mountain, you can clearly see a really cycle of six hours in these animals, whereas it's missing in the areas closer to the coast. Still in the process of trying to find out what could be the reason for a, a cyclic pattern during the coldest month, is it related to eating a feeding cycle or not, that they tend to eat food and then it's cold and then the temperature goes down and then it rises up again and then they eat again and it goes down. Could be a lot of things going on simultaneously. It's hard to tell in 15 minutes, uh, but I will try what I can. But this, clearly this cycle is missing or much damped in the area closer to the coast. Um, these are, and this is fascinating. This is in summer, very similar temperatures in both the areas. Individuals tend to raise the temperature in this area much higher during summer. Um, very intriguing details. Don't know what the reason is. Uh, we'll see as we go along. Uh, so this is the comparison for both the coldest and the hottest month. Um, this is summer and this is winter in both the areas. So they still have much lower temperatures in, in winter 
as compared to these ones, which have a cycle. I don't know why the cycle exists, but we'll keep on digging. Um, so I, did, I ran some GAMS. Sorry, it became a bit fuzzy because of the projection, I think. But so uh, what I tried to do here was I tried to see what the day when the temperature started to rise in, in both the areas. And this is the mean of both the areas together. So there is a slight difference in the, in the days when temperature started to rise for, on an average for individuals in, in an area. Uh, and then when it stopped rising and then when it starts to drop again. And it has some sort of implication perhaps um, when we try to relate these patterns of when they start migration or when they start to move more or less. So this was the aim to do these sort of analyses. Um, so this was more general patterns of when things happen, when things changed. And then are these patterns consistent across individuals? So trying to run some models using uh, predicting body temperature using the weight of the animals and which appears. So this line looked rather strange and flat, but the models show that there were significant differences in, in, in uh, heavier animals as opposed to lighter ones. So heavier animals have a higher body temperature, which makes sense. If you are larger, you need to raise your temperature to thermoregulate better. Um, no clear effect of age on body temperature. I guess it perhaps was correlated, but I expect the correlation is not large. Um, do these things affect the tendency to migrate? Uh, apparently, so we looked at the collar temperature, which we measure simultaneously. Um, so uh, area two apparently had higher temperatures on an average. So the ambient temperature was higher, but the moose temperature was lower in area two. Um, and then looking at the extents of these movements of these individuals, apparently there was a large variation in the extents these animals moved. So ranging from four kilometer to 120 kilometer throughout the year. So a, a huge variation across individuals. And then looking at the net square displacement patterns to see who was migratory and who was not and who was nomadic. Found 12 were migratory in one area. Um, most were migratory in one area, in area two, and the others had a mix. But on the other hand, then when we try to see if body temperature was predicting the, the migratory versus non-migratory behavior, there was no significant differences between body temperatures of migrants versus the residents. So it apparently work in a similar way. And do these changes affect movement? Uh, more models uh, looking at um, if collar temperature and actually snow depth affect a uh, tendency to migrate, which appeared quite well. So the snow depth was uh, the most important predictor that affected the tendency to migrate, and also collar temperature. Uh, this is an older result where I showed in another paper that age, snow, and roads and temperature were the most important variables predicting migratory tendency in moose. So uh, where does body temperature fit? Well, we can see later. Um, so I tried to look at simultaneous changes now. What happens to collar temperature, moose temperature, migration, and snow depth simultaneously when all put together? What goes first and what goes later? Um, it appears that um, changes occur simultaneously when other things are happening as well. Um, and it has been known that um, there's other things that animals may do to thermoregulate, like increase respiration rate and things like that. And they may start open mouth panting at certain temperatures. So this is something that needs to be more dug in soon. Um, and then also looking at uh, predictors, what predicted body temperature better? Um, I looked at snow, elevation, slope, season, ran different models for different area because individuals were doing different things. They were migratory, resident, nomadic, different areas. To see, so in area one, which was more mountainous, slope, age, uh, season, weight, color temperature, snow depth, elevation, they, all of these variables sort of put together uh, describe a lot of variation, but still not enough. So it was only 50%. So there's certainly more things that we need to dig in. Um, and looking at the other area, for example, um, this was also because it was more closer to the coast, so there was not a big influence of elevation or uh, slope here, but much more influence of snow depth and color temperature. And this surprisingly showed almost 68% variation. So there's different things going on in different areas. Individuals acclimatize differently, respond differently to different cues and things like that. Um, so in a, in a, to summarize, um, it appears that the ambient temperature is 
affecting the snow depth and things like that, which also affects the body temperature, and then snow affects the movement path, and sort of this sort of a link so is building up. But clearly, uh, there is more that we need to know. For example, I did not yet associate this with the habitat selection. This is just the preliminary analysis of what is there in both the areas. So apparently, very different habitats. These are Myers. Um, there's more Myers in area one and more heathland here. Whereas in this one, you have younger forest, and these are clear, clear cuts. More closer to, uh, to the coast, more intensive forestry, so more clear cuts, more food for moose. So there's clearly habitat level differences as well, we, we, which we might expect. And there's other things people have shown that moose run for thermal cover when they're hot. So this is something that we want to relate it to further as well. Now we, have, we know what's inside them. And also solar radiation influences thermoregulation, wind influences individual health and respiration rates, which we want to measure more now. So I guess this is more or less the story. Um, very complicated, not uh, still in development. And uh, hopefully, uh, the more analysis we go in time, it will be fun to, to put it together. Yeah, thank you very much. And this is a very famous comic we have in Sweden on moose. It's called Helge. Uh, uh, the word for moose in Swedish is elg. And this is called Helge. And it's a monthly issue that comes out with lots of fun things about moose. And here's a moose jumping in a pool. Um, yeah, and thanks to the funding agencies and Andy for compiling the snow data. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, we have we have some estimates of that, and so this one that I have now is is corrected for uh, those influences. There has been some work uh, we did with veterinarians and and people who developed a sensor that at, in Vienna, the, the veterinary institute. So the I to be honest, uh, I'm not very sure about what they found yet. But I was more I was more excited about connecting this to the movement part to to get more into it. But we are still working on and. I did not put together the heartbeat data yet in here, because we also have that, and which apparently is a bit much more noisy than the temperature data. So I will, I will come back to you with this answer. I don't really know, to be honest. Yes. How long did they last? These ones? Uh, I think it, right now they claim that it's around three years, Holger? They claim three years. Yeah. No, no. I mean, this one, for you. Yeah, this side. Yes, and residents as well. So um, this is uh, so some of these individuals tend to be resident in these mountainous areas. So they do a very short elevational migration, and some of these the ones which are closer to the coast, they may go even closer to the mountains. Um, it will be very interesting if you also go to Andy's talk, the guy who's sitting behind you, right behind you, uh, in, in two days. He will present the, the whole country scale data that we have, which was around 500 moose with GPS transmitters. So uh, that will be very interesting for you to, to relate to. Oh. Uh, yes, we do. We do, absolutely. And Apparently, what it appears is that in the north, it's more the climatic conditions that, that apparently drive their movements. But in the south, we have more population density in Sweden. So most of the roads and intensive forestry is also occurring in the south. And there's a lot of fencing around the roads, which impedes a lot of movements as well. So in a way, um, and also the snow conditions are way more extreme in the north. In the south, there's very little snow throughout the year. and uh, so some of the attributes of my being migratory is more towards snow conditions in the north. And year to year, changes in snow also sort of define if you will migrate or not. And also, the tendency to migrate declines with age. Uh, as you get older and there is more snow, you tend to migrate less. So sort of hinting towards the cost of movement when, as you get uh, older. And also, in some cases where we, in central Sweden, we have ro too many roads and they are fenced. So a lot of individuals are 
sort of movements are impeded because of the fencing of the roads as well. And then there's hunting, of course. So the, the hunting occurs on the whole country scale, and we shoot around 90,000 moose a year. So within a, mo a few months, um, yeah. And I haven't looked at density effects yet, so that's also another issue. Yeah. Any more questions? Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to okay. picture that. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you.